On August the 4th, 1914, Mr. Molyneux, headmaster of Wendover School, wrote in the school logbook that he felt compelled to put on record that England today declared war upon Germany. He continued, Mr. Gom, his assistant, has joined the territorial forces for home and foreign service, and I propose to record the names of all old boys of this school who serve in any of His Majesty's forces on land or sea. By the end of the war, the list had 75 names, and Mr. Gom had been seriously wounded in 1915. 219,000 people were recorded as living in Buckinghamshire in 1911. 44,000 of the men joined up. This film is about the people of Buckinghamshire and their contribution to the war effort. Above all, it is the story of those who remained in the county, sharing with the rest of the nation the grief and hardship of war and making their own contribution to the war effort. With the county's proximity to London, good communications and beautiful countryside, a number of large country houses dotted the landscape, providing employment both on the land and indoors. There were also small local industries. The woods of the Chilterns provided the basis for the furniture making industry and the manufacture of brushes, supplying London stores. A thriving printing industry had developed. Boots were made in local workshops and many breweries flourished. Only in the north of the county was their industry on a much larger scale. The London and North West Railway Carriage Works at Wolverton in 1914 employed over 4,500 men and women. A large pool of potential recruits, but on the other hand, an important industry to maintain for the war effort. For most people in Buckinghamshire, the 1914 August Bank Holiday was filled with village fates and dog shows. On August the 3rd, the day before Britain declared war, the Lee Bank Holiday cricket match was interrupted by rain. The captain, Ivor Stuart Liberty, aware of what was happening in Europe, felt the threat of war. He and his friends agreed to resume the match at the end of hostilities. They believed the war would be over in a matter of months. Ivor Stuart Liberty wrote in the parish magazine, From a merely worldly point of view, the countryman who enlists now is providing for himself an entire change of life, which almost amounts to a holiday, for it is not for a long time. Recruitment offices sprang up around the county in market squares, in offices, halls and pubs. Without the benefit of wireless communication, all recruitment notices and information was disseminated through public meetings and via posters and newspapers. Initially, the appeal was to a sense of adventure combined with patriotism. As the months stretched on, and news of the injuries and fatalities reached the population, the tenor of recruitment notices changed. There was now pressure to join up, and a sense of shame in remaining at home. Not just fighting men, but skilled recruits were also required for such things as road and rail repairs in France. By July 1918, men like Mr. Molyneux, aged 48, were being examined for military service. All over the county, training camps were rapidly established to accommodate waves of recruits. Lord Kitchener's friend, Alfred de Rothschild, threw open the park of Halton House, his Buckinghamshire home, 
for infantry training. Initially for the 21st Division, drawn from Yorkshire, Northumberland and Durham. With its road and rail links, this was an ideal site. A surge of activity ensued, with tent pitching, bugles sounding and columns of men marching in, to the astonishment of local people. Those living near the camps said they felt engulfed by the war. The Bucks Herald reported that shopkeepers were initially unable to cope with the volume of customers. But overall, the effect of training camps on local economies was positive, and towns that missed out were aggrieved. The breweries worked all hours, and there was great demand for pipes and cigarettes, as the majority of men were smokers. The postal services were fully stretched, and public buildings were made available to the YMCA. Mr Molyneux appealed for thousands of sheets of paper, for as many as a thousand letters and postcards were written nightly. Appalling weather conditions and disease required that tents give way eventually to wooden huts. The sheer volume of traffic and mud on the unmade up tracks had its effect. With the waterlogged ground, the camp gained the nickname Halton on Mud. In the early days, the press reported that a number of men deserted the camp because the food was so inadequate. At the magistrate's court, one of the deserters explained, I am willing to go and fight the Germans, but I want food and we can't get it at Halton. However, around the county, morale was generally high among the young men and cheery camp cultures developed. Despite the initial shortage of uniforms and guns, the Halton men, along with those at camps such as Bovingdon Green, West Wickham and High Wickham, embarked on training in bayonet fighting, bridge building, route marches and the grim new science of trench warfare. A network of practice trenches was built in the woods at Marlow and at Halton, in preparation for the Western Front. As the war progressed, the focus at Halton moved from infantry training to training aircraft mechanics for the Royal Flying Corps, which in 1918 became the Royal Air Force. Another immediate impact on the county was an influx of Belgian refugees. With the brutal invasion of Belgium in 1914, a quarter of a million Belgians arrived in Britain, and many were welcomed and cared for in Buckinghamshire. In October 1914, Sir Arthur and Lady Lee opened their house, Chequers, as a place of convalescence. They were later to give Chequers to the nation as a country base for future Prime Ministers. Their first patients were Belgian soldiers. Lady Lee wrote in her diary, they have no clothes or belongings, poor dears. We have had to fit them out in Arthur's pyjamas and buy them toothbrushes and shaving brushes. German prisoners of war also arrived in the county. They were put to work on the land, a way of life very different from being in the trenches, and then, in 1917, to building the large permanent workshops at Halton for the aeronautical engineers needed to maintain aircraft for the Royal Flying Corps. In 1916, in Great Missenden, the enterprising Herbert Sprake, who had set up the local fire brigade, informed the parish council that seven firemen had been to the recruitment office in the Cross Keys public house, so they would need replacing. He and one other were later to die. The king, George V, along with Queen Mary, paid several visits to the county, 
which raised morale. There was a constant fear of invasion. Lord Lincolnshire, who became Lord Lieutenant of the county in 1915, whose son and heir was killed at Ypres, masterminded the creation both nationally and locally of the Volunteer Training Corps, a precursor of the Home Guard. A county plan was drawn up with lines of responsibility for blowing up bridges, moving or slaughtering cattle, burning hay and hiding agricultural tools should the Germans invade. Lady Lee wrote in March 1917 that there were wild rumours this morning that the Germans have landed at Cromer in Norfolk. Soldiers were called away from the cinema in Aylesbury yesterday in the middle of the performance. At Wolverton Works, many were doing essential war work, although the place was perceived by some as a haven for shirkers. In fact, large numbers joined up immediately. And then, on September the 2nd, 1914, another 441 volunteers marched to Wolverton Station, led by the town band playing Colonel Bogey. By the end of the war, around 20% of the workforce had served in the armed forces. Back at the works within 10 days, as well as producing munitions and military transport trains, the remaining workforce were adapting mail and circus vans into ambulance trains, which acted as mobile hospitals. Many were converted, and in order to raise funds, Wolverton Works unveiled one of the ambulance trains to the public. This caused great interest, and sixpence, about £2.50 today, was charged to view the train before it was sent to France. In the Wolverton Express, they wrote, the train consists of 16 vehicles, and the total length is well over 900 feet, and can accommodate 362 patients together with medical and other staff. There were wards with bunks, operating tables, pharmacies, mess rooms and kitchens. The Navy wanted different ambulance trains from the Army. Theirs were painted grey, whereas the Army trains were khaki and both had red crosses painted on them. The Navy had port and starboard sides and suspended cots instead of the military bunks. Other Buckinghamshire craftsmen also adapted their skills for the war effort. Wickham chairmakers made the wooden parts for aircraft, including propellers. Undertakers and others made boxes for shells. Breweries, like Weathered's, were used for making munitions, and bootmakers turned out military boots. In Aylesbury, the firm of Putman's produced military tents, wagon covers, and even nose bags for the horses. The corn harvest came early in the fine summer of 1914. It was considered a good year agriculturally. Farmers were to feel the loss, not only of manpower, but also many of the horses were requisitioned for the front. By 1917, well over half a million horses had been procured by the army. In 1914, Britain was 60% reliant on food imported across the Atlantic. No allowance was made for the blockade of Britain by German submarines. That blockade nearly succeeded. Between February and April 1917, the new U-boats sank more than 500 merchant ships. In the second half of April, an average of 13 ships were sunk each day. In addition, the winter of 1916 was terrible, and with subsequent poor harvests, food stocks became perilously low. Fodder for dairy cattle and for the horses at the front both of which were prioritised, was in short supply. Sir Arthur Lee had become Director of Food Production in 1917 and described the situation as the deadliest secret of the war at that stage and one that could have led to defeat. 
A directive went out in 1917 to plough up pastures, gardens and allotments and make them productive. By 1918, the area of land under arable production was to increase by two million acres. On the Chequers estate, experimental, mechanised ploughing was set up by Sir Arthur Lee. There were very few tractors in Britain and he arranged for the importation of American tractors. All night ploughing was also attempted. In the local press, the County War Agricultural Executive Committee exhorted farmers to increase production. With the shortage of men, women were needed to work the land. They had to overcome hostility and prejudice to be accepted and trained to do the work. Sir Herbert Leon, who owned Bletchley Park, was quoted in the Bucks Herald as saying, the greatest thing they had to fight was prejudice, but he felt confident that in Bucks they would show that the women and old men, I and even the children, were determined to take their part and see that there was nothing to hamper their soldiers and sailors from winning a magnificent victory. In January 1917, at a moment when there was only three weeks food supply for the nation, the Women's Land Army was formed, along with the Women's Forestry Corps. Rousing rallies and recruitment speeches were made in public places by women, and in Buckinghamshire, 1,517 young women volunteered. Entry requirements were rigorous, and many failed to meet the standard. Although the work was hard, retention was high. Controversially, trousers were worn. Recruits were told, you are doing a man's work, and so you are dressed like a man. But remember, you should take care to behave like a British girl who expects chivalry and respect from everyone she meets. Florence Fremantle, a member of a family from Swanbourne, made sketches and recorded her life in the Women's Land Army. Children had always helped on the farms, but now they were essential. School timetables changed, and many school afternoons were dedicated to digging allotments, supplying fruit and vegetables to Belgian refugees, fatherless children, and even for the fleet. Family life was badly disrupted, and children had to grow up fast. By 1917, an estimated 600,000 children nationally had left school early to take up war work. It was very hard for those raising a family, often with the father away fighting. Food was limited and expensive, and eventually rationing came in. Children were told to gather every blackberry that can be got to make jam. You are doing your little bit to help feed our soldiers at the front. The school children also collected thousands of eggs. Some children wrote their names on the shells before they were distributed to the wounded. Buckinghamshire children even got involved in looking for scrap metal. They raised money for war relief, comforts for soldiers, and even for aeroplane parts. And they were also pressed into knitting. In fact, the soldiers in the trenches were overwhelmed with knitted garments of every shape and form. Foxgloves and deadly nightshade, along with other herbs, were gathered, as they were urgently needed for army medical purposes. In Chalfonts and Peter, Wynne's Vegetable Drug Plant Farm and School of Medicinal Herb Growing was established. Local scouts and guides had many roles to play. They helped with collections and digging allotments. 
they all learned first aid skills. Scouts patrolled railway bridges and key sites, such as the water tower at Coles Hill. In 1915, Baden Powell came to inspect the Buckinghamshire Scout troops. The leadership skills the Scouts acquired were valued by the military when they came to sign up. The role of women was also changing. In the absence of so many men, they were needed in the workplace. As well as working on the land, women took up jobs in transport, commerce and in the services. They were also employed in munitions workshops. However, the prevailing attitude of the man's role as breadwinner led to problems in the way pay was structured. In 1915, with rapidly rising living costs, the relatively few men working at McCorkadale's paperworks at Wolverton were paid a war bonus. The women mobilised and, supported by the men, went out on strike. After a lockout, the women were awarded a 7.5% increase for the duration of the war. Many of the wounded needed continuing care. The organisation of medical supplies, fundraising and much of the administration of care was undertaken by women volunteers. All over the county, large houses and smaller ones, along with schools and halls, were adapted for nursing and convalescence. Among the patients were Canadians and the King and Queen made a visit to their hospital at Cliveden. Although many of the injuries were horrendous and life-changing, efforts were made, both by the injured and by those that cared for them, to improve morale. Lady Lee's diary and photographs are full of examples of this. One grateful Canadian who had convalesced at Chequers wrote in 1916 from behind the line in France, saying that although it was good to get into harness again, my three months in England were the happiest in my life. In July 1916, Buckinghamshire was to suffer particularly heavy losses. The two Bucks battalions were involved in operations at Fromel and then at Pozières. In four days, 214 of them died. Half the 2nd 1st battalion were killed or wounded in a matter of minutes. In the tiny village of The Lee, between July and August 1916, 11 men died, including two sets of brothers. In August 1917, at Passchendaele, again the Bucks Battalion's casualties were very high. By the end of the war, Buckinghamshire lost over 8,000 men. In Great Missenden, in one short street alone, 10 families lost at least one person, and 213 men from Wolverton Works had died. Only one village in Buckinghamshire suffered no casualties. Stoke Hammond became one of the very few thankful villages in the whole country. On Armistice Day, November the 11th, 1918, the county joined in the national celebrations for the end of the war. The following year, on the 19th of July, 1919, which happened to be the anniversary of the Battle of Fromel, there were more organised celebrations for Peace Day.
However, the effect of the war was profound. There was so much grief over the appalling loss of life suffered on all sides, and many who returned were left with permanent injuries, both physical and mental. The war had taken a very heavy toll on the resources of the nation. In order that the sacrifices of so many should not be forgotten, over 400 memorials in all forms were created around the county. hundred years on, the nation still remembers that terrible conflict, which became known as the Great War. <laughs>